Welcome to Palm Sunday, everybody. <laughs> so good for us to be together. What an atmosphere of celebration that there is already. The fact that God is with us, we can already experience that there's something big happening next week as well. So it really is an awesome time to be together. If you wouldn't mind joining me in standing, and we're just going to just continue in this atmosphere of celebration, this atmosphere of faith, just to trust God that He can still do something significant in and through our hearts and in our lives, you know. For those of you who may not be familiar with what Palm Sunday is all about, you know, Palm Sunday is a celebration of, of uh, Jesus' triumphant entrance into Jerusalem a week before Easter. So there's the Palm Sunday, then there's Holy Week, and then Easter comes about. What's so significant about Palm Sunday is that it helps us to realize that we don't just enter into Easter. <laughs> you know, Jesus doesn't just speak at Easter, like, ha, ah, I'm risen, or ha. Ah. I'm, I'm going, oh, no, he doesn't think he says that either. <laughs> but what we realize from Palm Sunday is that Jesus is already inviting us and preparing our hearts for something big, something significant, something important in our lives. So we have the opportunity right now in this moment, in this tone of celebration, in this tone where we're just celebrating people who are starting new faith journeys in Jesus, where we're celebrating uh, what Jesus is doing in and through our hearts, we have the opportunity to allow him to continue to speak and do something significant in our lives, to invite us into something rich, something powerful. So with that, won't you please join me in raising up your hands, and let's just trust Jesus to speak to us today. In the midst of all that we may be going through in our lives and in our situations, in the midst of whatever it is that we may feel like is a struggle or a pain in our hearts, whatever it is that we're feeling like, like is a distraction from hearing what God has to say to us today, can I encourage us with raised arms and even raised voices if you've got a prayer in your heart, to allow Him to speak to you right now. Allow Him to start the work, the Easter work now. Lord Jesus, we thank You that You are with us. You are for us. Holy Spirit, You are intervening, hovering, pouring out more of Yourself, uh, heating us up, allowing us to have fertile soil to receive Your Word. Lord Jesus, we thank You that You are the miracle worker in our lives that despite whatever it is that we're going through, the challenges that we face, the, the issues that we go through, Lord, we thank you that you take care of them. You hold them. You are the one Isaiah 41 verse 10 speaks of and says, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for I hold you up with my victorious right hand. Thank you, Lord, that your hand's victorious. Thank you that your hand is for us. Thank you that your hand is good. Your hand is loving. Thank you, Lord, that you see us in our moments right now. Thank you, God, that whatever financial struggle we're going through, you have it in your hand. Whatever relational stress that we're facing, you have it in your hand. Whatever it is that's emotional or mental that just keeps weighing us down, it's in the palm of your hand. Your hand that's victorious. Your hand that is mighty. Your hand that is with us. Lord, we thank you that you sent your Holy Spirit to us, to speak to us, to be our champion, our paraclete, the one who comes alongside of us, helping us to recognize and realize that you are doing a work in and through our hearts. So Lord, as we trust in you today, as we hear your word today, please speak. <laughs> please help us to hear what you need us to hear. Please help us to accept the invitations that you want us to accept and help us to be the good news people we're able to take your word into every other day of our lives. In your mighty and powerful name, Lord Jesus, we pray. And everyone who was expectant said, Amen. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate Jesus today. <laughs> Serve a good God, a good Lord. <laughs> amazing, amazing, amazing. Or you may take your seat. <laughs> Again, welcome to Palm Sunday. What an amazing moment for us to be together. Next week is Easter, and we're in for incredible Easter services where Pastor Byron and Pastor Candice have got phenomenal messages uh, prepared for us. And just so you know, both Pastor Byron and Pastor Candice are at Rivers today. Um, Pastor Byron's preaching there, and it uh, is an amazing thing that, um, that we can pray for it and just trust that the same encouragement that we hear week in, week out from this platform, the Rivers Congregation get to receive that as well. So let's just keep them in, the, in our prayers all throughout the morning. But right now today, we are in uh, a moment where we're going to just prepare our hearts for Easter during this Palm Sunday. And what I wanted to do right off the bat is to ask us a question, a simple question for some of us. Maybe for some of us, it's a bit more challenging. But the question is, who has ever fulfilled one of their bucket list moments? With a <laughs> Got a Man United fan who, who, who is happy about it, apparently. Uh, <laughs> who has ever fulfilled a bucket list moment, whether it's going to Old Trafford or whether it's bungee jumping or eating an exotic meal, like 
snails with penguin juice on it. Like, I don't know, like, <laughs> people like things. <laughs> it's so cool. So many of us have already done so, you know. So many of us have had that feeling, you know, that feeling of joy, of accomplishment. Yes, I fulfilled a, a very awesome uh, bucket list moment. You know, I remember uh, myself having that feeling and that moment uh, when, in 2017, Amy and I were fortunate enough to watch a live Premier League game at Wembley Stadium in London. We were like, yes, yes. For Ames, this was a very highlight type moment in her life. For me, it was a bucket list moment. Like, come on, does life keep better than this? You know, like that type of thing. And uh, the moment almost never happened, and it just happened so unexpectedly. Because uh, the reason why we ended up going is because one of our friends uh, here at church, on the, in the lead up to the trip, you know, he had said to us, um, like, wouldn't it be cool to watch a game, like a Premier League game while you're there? I'm like, yeah, but how are we going to pull that off? He's like, I know a guy. Okay, okay, okay. So he introduced us to a guy who we'll know and speak of today as The Source. And The Source came up to, to us and, and sent us a few messages saying, hey, um, uh, like I've got tickets for you. Let me uh, just transfer the money through. I'll hook you up with the tickets. And yeah, we'll just do it back and forth. We loved this guy. We were like, oh my word. We got to London transferred the money into, into his account, told him when it was done, and then uh, we, they, we t- said to ourselves, yes, we, this guy is the best friend we'll never meet. You know, like, we, we love him. We love him to bits. You know, told him we transferred the money, and then there was silence for 24 hours. Now, 24 hours silence when you've sold both your kidneys for football tickets. <laughs> It's an extremely long time, you know? <laughs> so here we are, just like expecting like this, this news from this guy. All of a sudden, nothing's coming, and then we just turned on him in our minds, like when we were speaking to each other, like, yes, like, what a thug. Yes, we hate the source. You, if I ever meet the source, you, you, I'm going to go all Liam Neeson on him, like on Taken, you know, and just go, oh, no, like, till I get my money back, you know? Like, I was like, oh, this guy, what a frustration, you know? And then, the day before the game, he responded back. It's like, oh, I'm so sorry, sorry for the delay. I had to just organize a, a few things. I had to hustle because it is very last minute. So sorry. But here are the tickets. Uh, here you go. Gave us some helpful info on how it is we can navigate around the stadium, how it is we can enjoy the game a bit better. Then all of a sudden, we loved him again. More than before. Like, this is the best guy we've, we've never met. You know, like, we love this guy. We love this guy. You know? <laughs> and then uh, we ended up a day later watching the game. And here's the thing. While we were watching that game, while we were having... Well, I was having the best moment of my life up until then. Because it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, while we were just enjoying this moment, not a single thought was spared to the source. Not, like, I didn't even think of it, like, it didn't even like, pass our minds. In fact, since 2017 to this very moment right now, uh, or at least while I was preparing this week for the message, like, not a single thought has been shared whenever, when it was spared. Whenever I think about that day, and the story of that day, of that moment, he doesn't even come up once. Not even like a footnote in the story. Not even like, yeah, and there's a guy named The Source and he hooked us up with tickets. No, not even. It's like, oh, we went to London, we watched the game, we had fun, you know? It's like, almost like if you were around, you'd be like, hey, like, but like, how did you do it though? You know, like, come on, you know? You know but, and that's the thing, is that what we began to realize is that the person who deserved and still deserves all the praise and all the thanks uh, for that moment, the person who should actually be center stage of that experience is often forgotten. Not even like a single thought has been spread to him. And you know, the thing is, when it comes to our faith, and it comes to our faith journey whenever we're following Jesus, an important question we need to come to terms with daily is who gets center stage in the story of our lives? Who gets center stage in the story of our lives? When we tell the story of our marriages, our careers, our successes, our failures, when we reflect on our childhood, when we reflect on our children, when we think about our wealth and we think about all the things that we enjoy and love about life, when all is said and done, who gets the center stage as the one who did the most work, the one who uh, made the whole moment possible, the one who broke their backs to make the moment possible, the one who, who, who hustled and worked so extremely hard in the dark when no one else was watching <laughs> Who gets the praise when all is said and done? And it's an important question to ask and to answer ourselves because Palm Sunday helps us to recognize that one of its biggest lessons for us from that very first Palm Sunday moment that Amy read about earlier till today, one of its big lessons for us is that our lives are always at their best when Jesus is center stage 
of every single moment of our lives, no matter what. No matter if we're in a season of success, no matter if we're in a season of despair or a season of dryness, where everything maybe is like, meh, like whatever, like life is what life is, you know. Jesus must take center stage in our lives, in every season, so that he can be the one that makes the success sweeter. He can be the one that brings comfort in whenever there's despair. And he can, he can be the one who brings freshness and life whenever there's dryness. Only he can do that. And only he can do that when he takes center stage, despite the situation. So with that said, what today we're going to be doing, that, uh, doing and what today what we're going to be looking at is looking at how it is that Jesus can stay center stage in our lives, no matter what. So today's sermon title, and, and uh, hopefully a way of life for us going forward, is Jesus must take center stage, no matter what. <laughs> And again, this is a massive lesson from Palm Sunday because the crowds that gathered around Jesus that day, they did do that, you know. They celebrated Jesus, put him in center stage so we can learn from them on how it is that we can be like them and keep Jesus center stage in our lives. But what they didn't do is that they didn't keep him center stage no matter what. Because very quickly they realized that he wasn't the kind of king that they expected him to be. And as soon as that came about and as soon as they began to recognize that, they turned on him. And all of a sudden, praises to Jesus became death threats to crucify him. It all changed within five days, you know. Why? Because they kept him, at, at, at kept him center stage, but didn't do so no matter what. So what we're going to be doing today is learning and discovering, uh, based off what they did do and what they didn't do, how it is that we can keep Jesus center stage in our lives no matter what. And when we do that, we can see the powerful and the extraordinary life we can live on the back end of that. It's a great way to prepare ourselves before Easter. So with that, let's have a look at the account of Jesus' triumphant entrance into Jerusalem. It comes from John 12, verses 12 to 16, and it tells us this. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, and as it, uh, so that, as it was written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had, to be, had been done to him. So what we see from this account is actually two big lessons on how it is that we can keep Jesus front and center, center stage in our lives. And the first big lesson we see is keep the spotlight on Jesus. Keep the spotlight on Jesus. You now verses 12 to 13 tell us that the crowds had come to Jerusalem that day for a festival. Specifically, they came for the Passover festival, which essentially is like the, the biggest of all the festivals. You know, if you had to sum up God in the Old Testament, God in the Old Testament is a God of parties. He said, after the Exodus moment ha happened, he said, okay, you're going to have a party for this. You're going to have a party for that. You're going to have another party for this. You're going to have another party for that. You're going to have a sub-party for the first party that I told you about, and that party is going to last for a week. But then this party is going to last for a month, and you're just going to party. That's what the God of the Old Testament is. But then when it comes to the Passover, it's like the cherry on top of all the parties that they had. It was a big deal festival. So, they, so if you had to picture the Passover festival, pictures of the Rugby World Cup took place every year. And the Springboks were guaranteed to be in the final every year. And the Springboks were guaranteed to win the final every year. Like, can you picture it? It's like such a unifying like, festival, such a unifying party, you know? It's like, it's like you can just already smell the bra. Can you smell that? You know, you can like, smell that bra, you know? Now, replace divorce for lamb, and that's your Passover. You know, and there was like split lamb, there was bride lamb, there was like burnt lamb, there was, there was always just amazing lamb, you know? Just, just picture that. And in, in this moment, all of a sudden, they began to realize that, okay, we, we're having the Passover festival. Like, it's going to be a party. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then they, they hear that Jesus is coming. And by hearing that Jesus is coming, they lift their focus off their very important festival, and they paid attention to Jesus. I mean, that's how big a deal Jesus was for them, that he was worth saying, like, okay, whatever the Springbok result is, we'll get to that just now. Let's focus on Jesus. No, like it's really quite a big deal that they did. And the scripture tells us that they took down palm, palm branches and laid it before him so that the donkey can walk on top of the palm branches. 
you know. As some commentators or as, and some um, uh, biblical scholars say that those palm branches were equivalent to laying down your national flag on the floor. So much respect and so much honor given to Jesus. All that to say that in their most important week, Jesus was the most important thing. <laughs> sure, may the same be said of us. In the most important things in our lives, may Jesus be the most important thing. In the most important uh, financial decisions that we're making, the, in the most uh, crucial, important uh, 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 planning meetings that we're in at work, in the most uh, uh, testing and the most crucial family situations, family celebrations, and the most important uh, uh, situations that we, uh, and decisions that we make mentally and the, and the wisdom that we need to make them, in the most important moments in our lives, may Jesus be the most important thing right at the heart of them. Because when we do that, he is taking center stage. He, there's a spotlight on him, and it's not going anywhere because it's on the right place. You know, there's this painting in the uh, Berlin Art Gallery that's been painted by a painter named Adolf Menzel. And uh, you'll see it come up on the screen right now. And if it looks confusing, it's because it's an image that's supposed to depict a, uh, King, um, King Frederick the Great speaking to his generals. You know, and, and giving them orders and things. So what you see from the image is that you see all the generals being painted along the side, and then there's an outline and, a, and blankness right in the middle. It's because Menzel decided to draw the background and to paint the generals first, and then he was going to get to, to, do, so, uh, to do the king. Except that he died before he could finish the painting. So because of that, the painting looks confusing. <laughs> and because of that, I'm not laughing at his death, I'm laughing at the confusing painting, please. <laughs> <laughs> and now because of that, the painting is confusing, and it would have been such an amazing painting. It would have been such a renowned painting if he got the order right, <laughs> if he started with the king, if he shone the spotlight on the king first. But because he didn't shine the spotlight on the king, we're looking at the painting, looking, huh, it's a bit confusing. Imagine if we always just swap the order around in our lives. Imagine if we always paint the king first. Imagine if we always shine a spotlight on the king first. Even if everything else is a work in progress, our lives will always look extraordinary. They'll always look amazing because we've got the first thing right first. <laughs> so whenever we keep Jesus and, and whenever we keep the spotlight on him, what we begin to realize is that in the most important things in our lives, if he's the most important thing, a light is shining on him, and we get to celebrate him quite profoundly. So how do we always keep the, sh the spotlight shone on Jesus? Uh, we simply do what those, those crowds did on the very first Passover, and that's to worship him. Worship him. Worship him regardless of what situations we may be going through. If you're going through a great season in your life, financially, relationally, em emotionally as well, worship him. Like, just give him thanks for being faithful. Give him thanks for being good. You know, have verse 13 just on repeat in your mind, in your heart. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Because when we do that in those great moments, what we are actually doing is saying that, Jesus, I recognize that a spotlight deserves to be on you because you brought the success about. It wasn't me, it was you. So thank you. So that's what we do when we worship him in our successes. But maybe you're going through a season of discouragement and a season where things just aren't looking great at the moment. And even if you had to try to put it to words, you just can't take that heartache and, and find language for it. It's that deep. And if that's you, firstly, can I encourage you to not go through it alone? <laughs> you know, I've got an amazing prayer room with an amazing team that love to come alongside you, pray for you. If you need time to kind of process it and, and try to find language for it, use a prayer card, yellow prayer cards that are available, and just like write it down and be able to kind of like somehow put language to it. But even if you can't and you want to come through to the prayer room, our team will be patient and they'll wait for you. And you'll have an amazing cup of coffee while you wait as well. But can I encourage us to not go through things alone? Families should not go through struggles alone. And we are families, so let's stand alongside each other. But secondly, what you're able to do through seasons of discouragement is to worship him. <laughs> Again, thank him for his goodness. Thank him for his faithfulness. Have verse 13 on repeat in your mind and your heart. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Because what we begin to realize is that when we shine a spotlight on Jesus in the moments that are discouraging and the moments that, are, that we battle with, we are shining a spotlight on the only one who's able to bring about the breakthrough. 
And when the spotlight's on him, he can be hands off and say, thank you. Thank you that deliverance is coming. Thank you that you're doing something. Thank you that you care. Thank you that you see me. We're able to do that in those moments. So can I encourage us, good season or bad, let's worship him. Let's celebrate him. Let's thank him. Now, I used to do the lights at, at church a few years ago, and we have a spotlight feature there, and it's uh, used for like creative items and things. But boy, is that thing hard to navigate. Like you put it on, and then it's like you let go. Like, okay, this, this looks good. No, the spotlight is here. And then you let go, and then it shifts to here. And the person on, on platform is like here, and then they just experience darkness, and then they experience a, sh- a sudden sh- spotlight again. It's like, oh, what's happening? What's happening? You know? And like, the whole time, it's just, okay, cool, fine. I got it right on Thursday. Spotlight is on. And then switch on the computer, come Sunday morning, and all of a sudden the spotlight's there. It's like, oh, like I can't get this right. And then I have these mini heart attacks and panics. And then one of the guys on the team was like, this is how you do it. Firstly, calm down. Secondly, just nudge it slightly. And then thirdly, just let go. You know? And at the end of the day, that's what worship is all about. You know? it's, just, it's just calming down. It's our way to calm down, our way to just say, nudge our focus slightly, like, uh, like oh my word, this situation sucks. Uh, 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 Jesus is Lord. And it's our way of just letting go. God, you know more than what I do. So I'm just going to leave it in your hands. And just like the person on the platform that doesn't move, Jesus doesn't move. <laughs> He's always faithful, always mighty to save, always blesses, always cares, always has our best interests at heart. And it's up to us to just shine the spotlight on him. And at the end of the day, Worship should just be the, a lifestyle that we create every single day of our lives. It should be more than just 15 minutes at the start of a Sunday service. You know? Worship isn't that. It, worship isn't just the first 15 minutes on, on a Sunday. And worship definitely isn't a, a nice way for those who are late to discreetly come in through, like unnoticed. Like, oh, cool. This is a, this is a big solo that's happening here. Do, 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 do. I can come in. Okay, no, everyone's standing. Okay, pretend, you know. <laughs> Worship is more than that. You know, worship should be our lifestyles. Worship, worship at the end of the day is when we give our deepest affections and highest praise to something or someone who is worthy of it. So in obviously in our case, we are giving our highest affection and highest praise to Jesus because he's worth it. And true worship of God is when we prize God. We love God. We just prize God above everything else and put him first in our hearts. Meaning that Every word that we say, every action we do with our hands, everywhere we go with our feet, every thought we think, every, every feeling we feel, we commit it to Jesus first. We commit it to, to us believing deep down in our core that, that blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. You are holy God. You are king. And then from that place deep in our hearts comes whatever flows out of our mouths next, comes what happens with our hands next, comes where our feet go next. Because deep down, it's governed by who Jesus is, his power, his character, and his, and his authority. And when that takes place, what we end up seeing is that this is, these are some different ways in which we can worship. They're going to come up on the screen right now. If we are saying deep down in our hearts that Jesus is Lord, we are just giving him the praise and the highest praise that he deserves, then worship becomes that we thank God for his character and his power. We memorize verses that speak of God's character and power means that when we worship, we are actually singing songs that celebrate God's character and God's power. You know, we treat others the way God would treat them. We consider God first when it comes to our finances. We consider God first when, when we speak or before we act. Why? Why all of this? Because deep down in our souls, we know that. You know what, Lord? You are holy. You are worthy. You are first. And we take it from there. So all of these are powerful acts of worship because they come deep down in our spirits first. They come deep down from a heart that prizes God. Author David Hunt once said, Worship is the heart poured out in gratitude and awe, expressing our appreciation of who he is and what he has done for us by his grace through Jesus Christ. When we do that repeatedly, we're just keeping that spotlight where it belongs, on Jesus. So that's the first lesson we learn is keep the spotlight on Jesus. And then the second big lesson we find from this account on how it is that we can uh, keep Jesus at at center stage, first lesson, uh, second lesson we learn is for us to step out of the spotlight. Step out of the spotlight. (laughs) If Jesus is on the spotlight, we shouldn't be on the spotlight. (laughs) So if Jesus is front and center in the spotlight, what it means that our agenda is not. 
our preferred options are not, our plan A's are not, we are not, <laughs> because Jesus is. And when that's the case, it makes, it, um, it makes us so much more different than what the crowds were on that day. You know, the crowds that day, remember, they worshipped uh, Jesus because, yeah, you're king, you're Lord, you know. There they are. They had the spotlight on him firmly. Jesus is Lord. Yeah, he's king. Woohoo, king of Israel. And then as the course of the week went on, he's like, huh, this guy's flipping over tables. Huh, this guy's turning up fig trees into like dry, like withering, like firewood. Huh, this guy's saying, eat my body. He's saying, drink my blood. This guy's weird. <laughs> Crucify him! <You> know? <laughs> That's what happened in the course of a week because they refused to keep the spotlight on Jesus and therefore they put themselves back into the spotlight and put their agenda back into the spotlight. So that our, our, uh, our hearts and our lifestyles shouldn't be like that. Our lifestyles should be ones of those who stay out of the spotlight if Jesus is in it. And thankfully for us from this account, we actually see a group of people who did this exceptionally well and who can teach us on how it is that we can stay away from the spotlight that Jesus is already in. And that's Jesus' disciples. Now, we told us in verse 16 that at first, his disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. So like them, there are some situations and circumstances in our lives that we just don't understand. And maybe we won't understand this side of eternity. But like the disciples, what we're able to learn is that despite those situations, we can still say in the middle of the confusion that Jesus, I surrender center stage to you. In the middle of the confusion, we can still say that you know what you are doing. You know the story of my life better than what I know the story of my life. And that's what we see from the disciples. No, they didn't get it right for the next few days that followed. Eventually, they just left Jesus deserted. They scattered away when they realized that Jesus was getting crucified. But what we see from how they acknowledged Jesus from Palm Sunday and even through to the rest of their ministry, what we see is that they still surrendered to him. They still followed him. And as a result, in the midst of the confusion and their fears, they still kept him at the center they still reserved center stage for him no matter what. And we get the privilege and opportunity to do the same thing. At the end of the day, when you think about a center stage, it's reserved for the lead actor and the lead singer. So now picture if your role is tree number four, and then you decide, mm -mm, the lead actor is not doing great in their monologue. Yeah, it's like they're just getting the words wrong. I'm pretty sure those aren't the words. You know what? Forget being tree number four. I should be the lead, you know? And then, boom, center stage. Yeah. It just looks weird when tree number four <laughs> is center stage, you know? And sometimes we can do the same thing in our lives if we don't, if we, if we don't surrender to Jesus and we just give into the urge of, oh, no, let me take control, let me hold the reins. But my encouragement to us is that let's still allow Jesus to have the spotlight. Let's still surrender to him and let's still follow him. No, we follow even when we don't get the promotion that we've been praying for. We follow even when we don't get the healing that we've been trusting for. No, we follow even while waiting for forgiveness. We follow while waiting for the brokenness to heal. We follow while hoping for a turnaround that should have already arrived. We follow anyway. And when we do so, it's us surrendering the spotlight to Jesus because it belongs to him. So can I encourage us to be a people who surrender, who just Settle and say, no, Jesus, the spotlight is yours. I'll trust you in the confusion. I'll trust you when it doesn't make sense for me. I'll trust you as the one who knows the beginning and the end of my story. If you say that you're the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, then I'll trust you with both the beginning and the end and everything in between. And Jesus himself explains and describes what it looks like, what a life looks like when it's reserved for him being at the center. He says this, these beautiful words in Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and my burden is light. 
What a promise. It's a promise that the disciples experience. It's a promise that we get to experience. That there is a spotlight already in our lives. And when Jesus, what Jesus is saying is that if you're weighed down by trying to maintain your position in the spotlight, if you're weighed down by the pressure of being in the spotlight, if you're weighed down by trying to live the certain, the certain type of persona that looks good in the spotlight, then step aside and let me take the spotlight so that you can have rest, so that you can live a life that, that carries the light weight that he has for us. Tree number four doesn't seem glamorous, but tree number four, tree number four gets to experience the good work that the lead act is doing. (laughs) Tree number four is still a part of the play. Tree number four is still a part of something extraordinary and amazing. And that's what the disciples witnessed. Now we're told in the book of Acts that they were a part of miracle after miracle. They were the first recipients of the good news story. They're the ones who were first to see Jesus resurrected from the grave. They were amongst the first to get to uh, spread his gospel and watch the world get turned upside down because Jesus was Lord and Jesus was King from that moment onwards. They got to experience all of that because they chose to leave Jesus at the center and to follow him and to surrender him and to step out of of the spotlight themselves. So practically speaking, for us, we surrender whenever we be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and we do what Jesus did. Whenever we do that, it's us surrendering a spotlight to him. You know, we be with him whenever we absorb his word. You know, whenever we open up scripture and and discover what it is that he has to say uh, to us about himself. You know, we uh, we become like him whenever we hand over our worries to Jesus and say, uh, sorry, uh, to Jesus and to God, because that's what Jesus did. You know, every time he had a concern, a worry, a, a, a desire, a pleasure, he submitted it to God first. You know, whenever we do that, we ending, we ending up being the types of people who do what he did, and and then we, uh, we so who end up becoming like him, and we end up doing what he did every single time we live the way Jesus lived. Jesus lived generously. Jesus lived serving others. Jesus lived uh, loving others with his words and his actions. And we get to do the same thing and experience uh, the same things whenever we just do what he did. So can I encourage us, in every season of our lives, let's be with him, become like him, and do what he did. And as we do that, we're, giving him, we're surrendering the spotlight to him, and we're stepping away from it. And we're saying, no matter what, Lord, you deserve to be there. And a beautiful life is on the other side of committing to do that. So as we head into Easter, it's allowed Jesus to take center stage, no matter what. Center stage, no matter what. Let it be for Jesus. And somebody who did this extraordinary well was Mother Teresa. Now, she was once interviewed by Johnny Carson on, um, on his late night show before she was about to receive her Nobel Peace Prize. And he asked her, like, how, how are you going to handle the, all the accolades? You know? How are you going to handle being, like, when people come up to you and like, hey, Mother Teresa, woo Like, yeah. Best mother there is. Like, how are you going to handle all of that, you know? And her response was legendary. And it, I think it ought to be our response too. And I think if we can capture this as the types of people who want to be good news people, keep the spotlight on Jesus and keep him front and center, her response speaks volumes to us. And she said this, do you think for one moment that that little donkey that Jesus rode thought that the crowd was giving him the praise and glory instead of Jesus? <laughs> and imagine if that was our response to. Let's keep Jesus front and center in our lives. Let's keep him and give him center stage no matter what. Like she did, and she lived. And life is a bit more than just ordinary. <laughs> she lived an extraordinary life. And we get to live extraordinary lives too when we keep him front and center in our lives. And we do this every single time we worship and surrender, uh, worship Jesus and surrender to him, no matter what. By worshiping him, we're saying, the spotlight is yours. And whenever we surrender to him, surrender to him we say, I'm not in the spotlight, the spotlight is still yours. And let's be those types of people. Let's pray. I'd love to pray for those of us who are here today who may never have been made aware of who Jesus is in your life. And if that's you and you've never really considered who Jesus is, if that's you and you've always thought of Jesus as just some historical figure, potentially a madman, potentially an archaic man, if you ever just thought of Jesus as as someone who's just an optional extra in life, 
this moment is especially for you because I'd love to pray for you and to give you the opportunity of when you can give Jesus center stage in your life, where you can give Jesus the spotlight of your life and allow him to give you the life of rest and peace that he has to offer you. And all the while at the same time, recognize that when he is the Lord, King, and your friend in your life, he's able to do so much more than what you're able to do with your life. He's the one that knows the start and the end of your life, and he's the one who's able to do something extraordinarily better with your life than what you're able to. So if that's you in a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand after I've counted to three. And by doing so, I'll acknowledge it, and you can put your hand down. But then afterwards, I'd love to pray for you offer you just a short little prayer that it could be the language of your heart. And as I'm praying, you can just agree with that prayer. And what's going to be taking place is it's you sharpening that spotlight on Jesus and you beginning a journey where the spotlight just stays on Him. So I'm going to pray for us right now. And, um, and I'm going to count to three before I do so. And with all of our eyes closed and heads bowed, after I've counted to three, you can slip up your hand. And again, once I've acknowledged it, you can put, put it back down again. So at the count of three, one, two, three. Thank you. I see your hand in the middle here. So thank you at the back. I see your hands. Thank you. In the balcony, I see your hand as well. In the middle of the balcony as well. Thank you. I see your hand. Anyone else? Hey, it's the best decision you can make in your life. Thank you. In the middle as well. I see, I see your hand. We want Jesus to be front and center in your life, shining a spotlight in your life. Thank you. I see your hand in the side bank as well. Last call, thank you, man. Last call, you want Jesus to be front and center in your life. Thank you, I see your hand at the back as well. Such an amazing decision, thank you, sir. Such an amazing decision because you're allowing Jesus to be the front and center. You're allowing Jesus to be the spotlight just before Easter. It's so, so amazing. So let's pray together right now. Again, you can just allow it to be the language of your heart as I pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so, so much for entering into my heart, allowing me to recognize and to see you as the Lord and the Savior of my life. Thank you, Lord, for coming into my life right now and helping me to recognize that you deserve center stage, not me. Help me to keep you there. Please, Lord, forgive me for all the times where I've taken center stage myself. Forgive me for all the times where I thought the spotlight was for me. And help me, Lord, from here on in to keep you there. Holy Spirit, with your power, help me to keep Jesus front and center in my life. In your powerful name, Lord Jesus, I pray. And Lord, for everyone here today, for all of us, Lord, I pray one giant prayer, Lord, where we humbly come before you, Lord, as your people. And we say, please, Lord, as we enter into Holy Week, help us to keep you at the center. Help us to declare, like as we did already, that all hail you, King Jesus. Help us to continue to speak out loud every single day of our lives. And each day as we head into Easter, you deserve center stage. You deserve the spotlight. You are great even when I'm confused. You are great in my highest moments and you are great in my lowest. And Lord, as we gather back here on Good Friday, help us all to see you beautifully, clearly, and risen and lifted up. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.